Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 933rd New Social Environment. I'm Elmer, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Sina Najafi, Jeff Dolvin, and Louis Block. And we are really excited to have a closing reading by Dolvin today. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Sina Najafi is an is editor in chief of Cabinet Magazine and editorial director of Cabinet Books. He has also curated a number of exhibitions, including philosophical toys at Apex Art, Bubbles at Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Museum of Testing at Manifesto Seven. He's currently collaborating with Aaron Schuster on an exhibition on the theme of levitation and working on a book on the history of the naturalization ceremony in the U.S. The first installment of his project, Stand Up Tragedy, will be held at Cabinet's Brooklyn event space later this year. And Jeff Dolvin teaches and teaches poetry and poetics at Princeton University and is an editor at large at Cabinet. He's written for magazines on topics ranging from player pianos to quant quantitative meter to handle theory and is the author of Take Care in Cabinet's series of 24-hour books. He is also the editor of Cabinet's forthcoming collection of psychedelic grammar exercises, The Virtual Sentence. And our host today, Louis Block, is a Brooklyn-based painter and writer. His writing has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic, and Full Bleed Journal, and his work has been shown in New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Venice. And we're so lucky to have him as the managing one of the managing directors here at the Rail. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Louis, and thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, and thank you, Sina and Jeff, for coming on. And um, this is a great opportunity to learn more about Cabinet, both as a, a magazine and publication and as a, a larger organization. Um, so I think maybe, Eleanor, if we can pull up the just the covers of Cabinet to, uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, maybe, Sina, we could start with um, your um, background before the founding of Cabinet. Um, I know you're Index Magazine briefly. Um, what led to the beginning of Cabinet? Um, yeah, this, the Index is not the New York-based Index, but a magazine of the same name uh, in Stockholm, um, just to be clear. Uh, it's not Peter Halley's Index. Um, uh, I was part of that magazine in Stockholm and then part of another magazine called Merge, which was um, between Stockholm and New York. I used to live in Stockholm, hence the Stockholm heavy um, uh, magazine involvement. Um, and uh, part of the reason for Cabinet was there were so many um, uh, interesting things I felt that both uh, Index and Merge, could, you know, neither of them could really... Um, take on um, because they weren't academic enough in some sense and they weren't uh, able to um, address some of the kinds of juxtapositions that cabinet wanted to have, both in terms of topics, but also in terms of, uh, let's say, spirit or mood. Uh, so cabinet, especially in its earlier issues, would have a lot of um, things that were quite jocular or even seem like pranks uh, next to quite serious pieces. And those juxtapositions were important, I think, to some of the things that would happen in the magazine. I don't think any of them were frivolous. Uh, that's for others to judge, of course. But um, the magazine was built to kind of accommodate a very, as I said, in the um, maybe in the bio, an anthropological sense of culture, so that nothing was uh, excluded uh, you know, per se, everything could be made a subject of interest uh, within our pages. And I myself studied uh, comparative literature, but in a very um, 
with a very heavy uh, emphasis on cultural studies. Um, so that was sort of a background that already um, accommodated that kind of larger, more Catholic sense of you know what culture is and can be. Mm -hmm. And besides Merge and Index, um, what what were the other publications at the time that um, either you were reading or involved with in any other way? Um, were there any that you found useful as guides for certain um, ideas that, that led to cabinet or things you were responding against? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there are a lot of... Uh... A lot of uh, interesting things uh, that that you know you take on board. It was really a kind of a question of what different things from different magazines you could bring together in one magazine. That was more the kinds of conversations that we were having at the beginning of the magazine, rather than look at this one publication and can we kind of you know copy it or something like that. Um, I remember once I asked a professor of mine about uh, magazines he liked. And at Berkeley in the 70s, there was a magazine called Chicken that Berkeley was putting out. And the idea was that a magazine called Chicken could unite every single discipline at Berkeley. Everybody from the economists to the people, you know, um, from the, to the artists could have something to say about chickens. And... Um, this was their attempt at a huge cross-disciplinary magazine. And, uh, you know, that that stayed with me, that, you know, something as humble as a chicken can actually be the place where all these disciplines can um, encounter one another and, uh, you know, have fun uh, and crossover. Yeah. And maybe we could talk about um, the, um, I believe it, you've called it a coat of arms. Yeah, here we go. The Fox and the Hedgehog, um, which um, refers, I think, both to Isaiah Berlin's essay and back to um, ancient Greek poets, um, the fox being uh, some someone that knows many small things. The hedgehog knows one, uh, one large thing. Yeah, this was, a. Uh, I mean, like every magazine and like every endeavor, some of the stuff is retroactive uh, in the sense that the shield was quite late when we moved into our current space. We decided to have a coat of arms, uh, a tongue in cheek coat of arms, but it's still, uh, you know, um, functions and it's hanging outside of our building at the moment. And uh, it was a so that particular essay from Isaiah Berlin was very important uh, to us. It's an essay really about Tolstoy and what kind of thinker Tolstoy is, but he goes back to this fragment, as you said, and thinks about two kinds of thinking. Um, and it was only retroactive in the sense that only in 2008 did we kind of coming across, um, coming across the essay, think in some sense that is one encapsulation, there are others, of what the magazine tries to do and um, as a kind of a meeting ground for two very different kinds of thinking and not dismissing either of them. And uh, as I said in the bio, in some sense, let's say the, the hedgehog uh, that Bar Berlin thinks is the systematizer knows one big thing and everything can go into a system for him. Someone like Dante is a, is a, is a hedgehog. His Christianity allows everything to be pulled in. And the fox for him, is someone like Shakespeare, for example. Um, so these aren't, meant to be higher or lower modes of knowledge. And for us, you know, the academic and a certain kind of artist were two ciphers through which this shield could get animated. Um, but they're, they're, that's a very, you know, grosso modo kind of uh, uh, encapsulation of it. So Jeff, do yeah. you have some thoughts about those two animals? <laughs> yeah, I I came to the magazine when it was uh, sort of well underway and it's, uh, you know, it's it's burrowing and it's uh, sort of fox scouting. Um, but I, uh, I I'd been for five or six years uh, professor at Princeton at that point, and I was hired to teach 16th century literature, comma, non-dramatic. Uh, which feels like a highly specialized and especially unpromising uh, uh, area in which to concentrate. And, and I'd, I'd just gotten tenure and I'd done it by you know, writing a book about 
Edmund Spencer and about Renaissance pedagogy, and uh, I think had had done what I needed to do as an academic with a uh, with a particular specialization and vivified that as much as as much as I could. But uh, Tony Grafton, who's the kind of omnicompetent early modern historian at Princeton, did an event at Princeton on little magazines, and he invited a bunch of different editors to come from N plus one, McSweeney's, and and Cena came uh, from cabinet and I ended up sitting next to him and it was sort of an electric e experience in some of the ways that he's he's been saying this felt like it was a magazine that was sort of open to the world of the disciplines and the kinds of expertise that get cultivated in universities and at the same time had uh, such a sense of ludic opportunity in relation to the kinds of things that you could think about uh, and the sort of areas of, of life and thinking that you could bring together. So um, for me, in a sense, uh, I, 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 f I felt like I'd been a hedgehog and was uh, suddenly in a room of foxes uh, and the company was really exhilarating. Uh, and so I just, uh, I just attached myself as best I could from then forward. And uh, beyond the, you know, striving for interdisciplinary um community and and authors and writers um who who were the integral people right at the foundation Sina? um right at the foundation there were a number of people that um i knew from various uh, you know from various places um the main person in the magazine at the time was um brian conley who's an artist uh and conversations with him uh, were the kind of uh, very important, and he was editor in chief for the first uh, two, three issues um, of the magazine. Um, uh, and then there are a number of artists and also academics who were very important to the magazine. David Serling, for example, uh, who is a professor now in California, had written for my old magazine, Index, and was a friend, and those conversations were very important. Um, and a number of other people. Um, and then um, my main uh, partner in the magazine at the moment is uh, with whom I do all the editing is Jeffrey Kastner, who joined issue three of the magazine. Um, so there have been, yeah, there, been, there were a lot of conversations with a lot of different kinds of people who joined the magazine. And then I, I think one of the most remarkable things about cabinet is this structure that is in every issue um divided into three parts basically where there are columns at the beginning a main section uh which is maybe less constrained or uh, i don't know if you describe it that way but more open uh, and then a, a themed section which carries the theme of each issue um was that there right from the beginning it was we wanted to have some columns from issue one but we didn't want the columns to be thematic, like, you know, law or, you know. Um, so I'll tell you about one column that we we even thought very hard about commissioning pieces and we even had ideas for and we dumped just to give you a sense of where we were going. We had, we had a column for a while, column idea for a while called um, Tuesday. The idea was to pick the most mundane, like not, not Saturday or Sunday, not even Monday, but Tuesday and think about a column that, somehow thinks about this day in history, Tuesday, and uh, it wasn't a good idea. But uh, just to say the kinds of things we were thinking about, the columns we did end up with, um, there's one called Colors, where we assign a color to somebody and ask them to write about it. Um, and that's ranged from art history to sociology to, um, to, um, to um, the history of pigments, to all kinds of things. Um, we had one, for example, on the color used in um, prisons, uh, prison cells to um, calm inmates um, and the history of that particular color. Uh, there's one called ingestion, which is not about food alone, um, although it often is. Uh, it's about meant to be about whatever can be taken in into an organism. Food is one of them. We have a column called leftovers which is um, about some kind of remainder understood in any particular sense. And then we've had individual columns by people for a particular period of time. Um, 
that they've come up with and we've published. Yeah, I loved, especially, um, I, I think it's maybe the first or the second of the colors columns, but uh, Albert Mobilia's Rust is really amazing. That is an amazing. It demonstrates piece. just like from the outset, the possibility of such a, a prompt. Yeah, and then that column hasn't retired officially, but it's more or less retired because at some point we couldn't think of any more colors. <laughs> how, how the process of, because the the color is given to the writer instead of the writer coming up with the color. What yes. is the process, if there is any, uh, among you and the editors of coming up with those colors? Well, first you'd have to come up with a color, which we used to be easy, but then you know at some point you're like, you know, you go into finer and finer shades of various things, and then you wonder if that has enough um, enough traction in some sense. You know, once you go into particular like very, very small niche colors. Um, but once you've sort of got your list, uh, that was a collective, you know, uh, collective enterprise, then you have to think of a person who could address it, but not directly in some sense. Like someone's written a book on the history of blue, we wouldn't give them blue, you know, we would give them something else. So in some sense, we wanted them to be um, a little surprised and a little perhaps challenged by what we've given them rather than the most obvious ones, if they have worked with something that corresponds to that particular color, you know? So something with skew, something a little aslant was better than something direct for us. When I think of deep history of, of the magazine, the sort of cabinet of the title is among other things, a kind of cabinet of curiosities, a sort of uh, 18th century um, proto-scientific practice 17th century um but there's also somewhere in the deep background a figure like uh erasmus um whose notion of rhetorical productivity had to do with setting yourself a challenge that you didn't have to do 200 times uh and watching the results get weirder and weirder um and so there's something of that engine in the in the columns i think you know as the colors start to get out towards Verdigris, for example, which is the one that I did, then there's a certain kind of productive desperation that sets in. And, uh, I, so I, I love especially the, the out columns in each of those series. And it, um, most of the columns had obviously a different writer each issue, um, and the prompt was sort of what was connecting them issue to issue. But then at a certain point, there are specific writers that have their own columns, which appear issue by issue, like Wayne Kostenbaum. How did that come about? Um, Wayne actually will come, maybe we should show the slide. Um, can we show a particular slide? And Jeff can tell you where that column comes from. It would be slide number uh, 3839, if you jump there. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's me in the nut bunk. Uh, although Wayne uh, Wayne joined me shortly into the conversation, um, it's another it's another side of the magazine uh, that it sponsors a lot of uh, events. Um, and uh, if my first you know encounter, I was meeting Cena at Princeton. The first time I was actually in in the sort of cabinet world on its own home turf was coming into the space and seeing that there were these two enormous tennis umpire chairs that were just sort of set up there for what possible purpose? I'm like, well, what better way for uh, people to talk to each other than from two uh, tennis umpire chairs? And, and that kind of um, playful, uh, serial ludic wager um, feels like it's sort of characteristic of a lot of the a lot of the magazine's enterprises, and, and that includes these events. Sina, um, uh, I grew up in Iran and England, and uh, hence has often lamented that he didn't have that kind of or American experience of being in a bunk bed, <laughs> which all, we, all of us Americans, of course, have, and of that particular kind of conversation that goes on between uh, between the party in the top bunk and the party in the bottom bunk. So this, what we're seeing now is an image from a series of bunk bed conversations, which were staged on plausibly intellectual topics. Uh, this one was about sleep and poetry. 
between kind of plausibly credentialed people to speak about such questions, uh, but in their pajamas <laughs> and in a bunk bed. So that's Wayne Kestenbaum down below, and that's me up top. And we sort of batted the question back and forth of what these two things have to do with each other, sleep and poetry. But we were continuously or continually uh, provoked or derailed by images that Cena was projecting. You can see one of them uh, to the left of the bed there. Um, and uh, Wayne is the most uh, kind of magnificent sort of riffer on just about anything you, you give him. But if you show him a picture such as that one, uh, he'll take a look at these gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen slumped in the bed in, in, in their suits and loose collars. Uh, and Cena may have asked him, or he may just have said it spontaneously, like, what is this scene? He turns to the audience, he says, that is the Frankfurt School. And so there was general kind of astonishment and hilarity at this kind of obviously correct and yet so unexpected diagnosis. And that the idea that that was a, a caption for that image kind of caught hold of everybody afterwards. And I think, you know, Cena and Wayne got to talking about it and the idea that um, there might be a series of such provocations for Wayne where his challenge would be just to provide a caption. What's the poetics of a caption? How does it attach to an image? Uh, and so that gave Wayne a chance uh, both to experiment uh, with that sort of particular quasi uh, poetic idiom um, and ultimately to assemble a little book of the columns called Notes on Gaze. And since we're talking about images in the, the magazine, I, wa I wanted to talk about general editorial uh, process a little bit as well, but I worked at the rail um, for years and part of my job has been image sourcing and um, it's a very interesting problem, uh, especially if you have, um, you know, a budget to consider or um, the author does not provide an image. So I wanted to ask um, about your relationship to images in in the paper, how they're sourced. Um, you know, sometimes they're not directly referential to the text. Uh, how, how does that work with Cabinet? Um, sometimes the author has strong ideas and strong images, um, but sometimes, most often, we are the ones who are in charge of getting them and deciding what to have. Um, uh, sourcing them, I mean, you know, we do we do visit dusty corners of libraries, you know, quite often and have people scanning directly from books, uh, you know, especially in the earlier issues, I'd say half of them were scanned from books somehow here or there. Um, we don't have a budget at all for images. So, you know, if we spend $100, $200 per issue on images, that's like really the max we can do. So we don't pay for images for coming from places. We're a nonprofit. And so we're very good at um, pleading for free images from archives that, you know, where we can't get them from elsewhere. We're also huge believers in um, fair use. So as a nonprofit, we feel quite strongly that, you know, if an image is copyrighted and the person who has it is asking for a tremendous fee, which is, you know, uh, makes it unusable by us, we're usually okay using it under fair use and claim it as fair use. Uh, we lament the fact that fair use has, uh, you know, atrophied as people have gotten more and more scared of lawsuits. Uh, and so less people use it now, that fewer people use it now than they, than they should. Um, and um, so the images sort of, you know, like for example, that one came from the very people who wrote that article, which is about the largest traffic infrastructure in the world, which is LA's and how something like that is made to function. Uh, and, um, but, you know, a lot of them are sourced by us in various ways, not having a budget makes you resourceful and brave. <laughs> so um, there was a column, for example, that we had um, uh, that was about uh, this particular cookbook that MoMA had put out with artists had suggested recipes. And some of them are real recipes and some of them are completely imaginary recipes. Um, take three universes, put it in a pot, you know, that kind of thing as well. 
and um, Jeffrey Kastner, who wrote that article, we wanted some images from the cookbook, uh, which is out of print. And MoMA had given us uh, some unbelievable price to, to have those five or six images, which we really needed, like $500 each or something. We asked the uh, photographer directly if we could use them. And he said, I don't know if I have copyright, but do use, as far as I'm concerned, use them. And then we did use them. And uh, I did get an email from MoMA saying, we told you that, you know, this is how much it costs, and yet you went ahead and used it and uh, used those images. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that out-of-print book should be seen, republished maybe, but, you know, the idea that we shouldn't use it because we don't have the money seems to me like a, um, it's a shame. Let's just leave it at that, that they shouldn't be used because nobody can afford to publish those uh, images. So, But the, there is also a, a joy in knowing that there is no budget for uh, an image and scouring the public domain and various ar archives and trying to find something that fits. There is. I mean, in fact, in some sense, like running a nonprofit, which is underfunded and understaffed, produces a kind of joy as well as the hardships, because, you know, uh, there is something to be proud of when you run a small organization, um, knowing that you've done a lot with this small amounts, you know, and you've made something you know, using very little, um, very little amounts of money or manpower. So, you know, we are very proud of um, some of the back end work that we do that has made some of our work very streamlined and little tiny changes that produce, make some task, you know, take seven minutes less, but then over the years, you know, it's a lot. Uh, so, so those are important to us as well, how to run things as efficient as possible, um, you know, uh, it's uh, every nonprofit has to do that, but you know, um, it is it is a it is a challenge, but also a pleasure, I think. And what is that structure um, in the office, the the staff or larger community of um, you know volunteers, part time, yeah. full time? Who who makes the physical object? Um, well, we have a our designer Jessica lives around the corner from the cabinet office. Um, but her work is mainly online now. Uh, we communicate more or less online. Um, Jeffrey Kastner, who's the main person that I edit the magazine with, also lives around the corner. But a lot of our work is done online, especially since I moved to Berlin more or less uh, a number of years ago. I spent most of my time in Berlin. So we have a small office there with um, two people and an intern at any one time. And the office here is... Um, Emily Mayer, who's our operations manager here, uh, usually one intern, and now I'm here in New York, so me. Uh, but most of it is just online at this point, you know. And mm -hmm. editing, I think, online works just as well. Uh, you know, uh, we share a screen. And I guess, you know, this is a moment to also say that our editing process is unusual because it's um, we do everything live. Uh, we have two people, uh, usually me and Jeff Kastner, sitting you know, side by side if we're here or, you know, remotely. Uh, that is the mailman. I will be back in a second. Jeff, do you want to go no, back? No. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. Uh, it's my favorite, uh, my favorite metaphor for the experience of being edited by cabinet is, is rolfing, uh, which is that species of extremely painful deep tissue massage, uh, which does leave you sort of transfigured and improved but is excruciating as long as it's happening. Um, Sina and Jeff, uh, I believe I'm right about this, sit together in front of the text and read each sentence, each to the other, um, and satisfy themselves that it is both true and beautiful before they move on to the next sentence. And <laughs> if they find it- It has, it has to be heard out loud. It has to be heard out loud. It has to be heard out loud in both of their voices and then heard out loud twice. Um, and if there's any concern uh, about its truth or its beauty, um, then uh, inter interstitial, bold, and red colored commentary starts to appear. Um, and over the course of an edit, this can metastasize to easily twice the length of the article under consideration. <laughs> And it's it is a it is a kind of poetry. Um, I I've never had such scrupulous attention to my own prose 
um, and I don't know where else in the in the wide world you get it, um, but it is uh, it's a magnificent um, it's a magnificent process, and it's one of you know cabinet uh, as Sina describes it has some real economies. Um, it also uh, has sort of flagrant excesses and, and wastes, and the editorial process is, in a sense, one of those. It's one of the most gratuitous exercises in, uh, in care that I've ever encountered. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, it's one of the things that keeps drawing me to the, to the magazine. Well, it's interesting to hear how, how thorough the process is because with um, such thoroughness, I, obviously you run the risk of um, taking away unique voices of individual writers. And that's certainly not the case when you read through all of the different writers that uh, participate in the magazine. There's mm. certainly uh, a unique voice you, uh, every time. I think that's 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 profoundly true. Um, that for all of the for all of the attention you get, um, you, you, you're, it's not a question of replacing your words or suggesting you should write this differently. Um, sort of clarity, accuracy, um, uh, and. <clears throat> um, what is it? There's a certain uh, there's a certain spiritedness, I think, to a to a cabinet essay. Um, a sense you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about humor. Hasini was saying how important that was to the early magazine, and by by no means is it always the case that it's funny, but it often is. And what I think it gets out of funniness is um, a certain kind of jump or spark or surprise or slight derailment from where we were before we laughed. Um, and even if the sort of symptom of that adjustment isn't laughter, uh, I think cabinet is, is always pressing its, its writers to surprise themselves. Um, so I feel like I've learned a lot about how I write uh, from the editing I've, I've, I've gotten. And cabinet uh, has an, an open submission process for um, for most of the magazine. Am I correct? Yes, we've 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 published a lot of people that we didn't know who came through the uh, open process um, uh, over the years. Not so much for the books, but for the magazine itself. Um, yeah. Um, and then in terms of columns, themed um, themed pieces uh, for each issue. What is the timeline like in terms of the work? Are are multiple issues being worked on at the same time, or is it really finish one and then begin the next? No, no. For a long, long time, we had multiple issues that we worked on at the same time. Uh, issues like that take a long time because you come up with a theme. You pick the theme um, partly because you trust that the theme can go into the nooks and crannies of various kinds of, you know, uh, modes of inquiry um but we always thought that you should have one like longer piece that you can imagine and you kind of could almost attach a writer to it and maybe one or two things that were firm and then after that it really was trusting the theme you know whether it's something apparently mundane like hair or small like insects or you know great themes like you know love or something so trusting that it can go into, you know, not just stay pooled in one cultural location, but just kind of put out tentacles everywhere. So a lot of it was done on trust, uh, but we would have to, you know, have three or four issues at a time we're working on. Currently, we have a, our last print issue is, uh, we should have been out about two years ago, which um, just serendipitously had the uh, topic of the end has still not come out and maybe it will never come out. I'm not sure, but we're putting it online, but we're also publishing issue 69 at the same time. And in fact, about to put something up for issue 70. So three issues at the same moment are being published online at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, but typically, you know, it would be multiple issues ahead that we'd be thinking of. The moment an issue would come back from the press, we'd already moved on typically to two issues down the line in terms of editing. Mm -hmm. it, we used to be a quarterly. So, uh, and then when we go fully online, we will be a monthly with far fewer articles, of course, you know, 
five or six articles per issue. Um, yeah. Well, we're, we're looking at, at books on the screen right now, so maybe we should transition a bit and talk about yeah. the book publishing side of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, when, when did that begin? Book publishing almost from the very first, you know, the first book came out in 2002, I think. Um, but it's been a sporadic, you know, endeavor. We've published a book when we had an interesting writer, an interesting idea. Um, there have been a couple of series. Uh, well, there's actually been one series, which is the 24-hour books, which we can talk about in a second. Uh, but now that we're going online, we'll be publishing a lot more books. So we have a number of series we're launching, and I have some images of a couple of them here. Um, should we start with? Um, well, I know J Jeff has written one of the 24-hour books. Yes. So I know yeah. I'm curious to hear about the, the physical and mental experience of yeah. doing such a thing. Can we actually see slide 27 one second? Because uh, that's the very first um, book. And <laughs> that's the scenario, a cabinet, when somebody's writing their book, which we have a huge clock hanging over their head because they've got you know 24 hours to write the thing. But we also have to be there ourselves to edit uh, our designers here to design any fact checking, everything has to be done in 24 hours and sent to the printer at 10 a.m. the next day. So under such a clock was Jeff laboring away. Uh, <laughs> although I don't have yeah. a picture. And I, I, I can say a little bit about the rigors of that experience, but, but just in relation to Brian's book, which was the first in the series, I am sitting in a room. Um, it might be worth uh, saying that not only did, did he produce that book uh, in the in the promised 24 hours and off it went to the printers. Um, but we convened at Princeton the next day a symposium on that book <laughs> uh, with presentations from uh, about 30 faculty and graduate students who had written uh, reviews and essays uh, apropos of the book, uh, which were due sort of 24 hours after its publication and which were then immediately published as a collection uh, of, uh, of its own, a sort of companion volume of criticism and, and response all within 48 hours. And that um, feels like another instance of the kind of <clears throat> back and forth between the world of, of artists and writers and the sort of circulating around Brooklyn and the various university affiliations that people have, because a lot of the students who are writing um, for reading rooms, which was the name of the volume of response, were involved in a, a then new interdisciplinary doctoral program in the humanities at Princeton. Um, and we took a lot of inspiration uh, from, uh, from Cabinet in setting that program up, trying to think about interdisciplinarity as not just a sort of combination of, of various existing disciplines at the extremities of their specialization, um, but as something like uh, the kind of uh, surprise and sort of formal and generic innovation that, that we were getting from experiences with Cabinet. Graham Burnett, who's written a lot for the magazine and has been an editor, was a big part of that too. Um, so <clears throat> that first 24 hour book uh, shuttled sort of right from Prince, right from Brooklyn to Princeton and bang out into the world. Um, the, the book that I wrote uh, from 7 a.m. on whatever morning, oh, Tuesday morning, I think it was. 31. <laughs> 31 uh, until 7 a.m. the next morning um, was uh, part of a, a set of books um, two, the other written by Sally O'Reilly, and both of them in response to the same prompt. And maybe we could get that cover yep. on the screen. Like 31. Um, so there, there are our matching books, The Ambivalence and Take Care. Uh, and on the next page, you'll see what Cena gave us to write about. Some of the authors of the 24-hour books sort of sat down with their own topics. Uh, but for me and Sally, um, 24 hours in advance of the beginning of the writing of the book, we received a copy of the Braintree Scientific 1986 catalog and then had that time 
uh, to think about what book we were going to write and then 24 hours in which to write it. And this happens to be a, a catalog of instruments for experimentation on lab animals. Uh, and it's a conceit of the series from the Braintree Corporation that uh, each cover each year features um, a rat in some posture derived from the history of Western art. Uh, so I think Sina was uh, uh, provoked, and perhaps troubled <laughs> by encountering this and decided that it, you know, a book needed to be written and a book needed to be written right away. Um, so, uh, so Sally and I sat down simultaneously, she in London and, and me in Brooklyn and got to, got to writing. Um, and, uh, the editor was right there. So as I finished pages, I would hand them over. Uh, we were thinking about design on the fly. Um, it's a feature of the books that they sort of pay some attention to the physical demands under which the author is working. So at the end of the each, you'll see an account of uh, exactly what they ate to sustain themselves over that period. So uh, now the series has several different accounts of how you can nourish yourself if you mean to keep writing for 24 hours straight. I think I slept for about an hour and a half between draft one and draft two. I don't think Cena did sleep. I think he was up editing during those hours. Uh, and then, uh, and then in, uh, you know, as the deadline approached, uh, we pulled everything together and then truly, truly at 7 a.m. pressed uh, send and off it went to the printers. And that's what you see before you. And Sally's book uh, took the form of a series of letters to the company from various people, some thrilled by the catalog, some, you know, some troubled and all kinds of other, uh, all kinds of other responses to the catalog. They're very funny sets of letters written to the managers of the company um, under different names and guises. Yeah, maybe just to say it was such, you know, it, it, it was kind of an intellectual event for me to write the book. The problem that I got going on was the relationship between care and ethics, which they seem like such absolutely coextensive categories, but sort of whether it was possible to exercise a certain kind of creaturely care, um, independent of any larger ethical considerations, whether this is right or wrong to do so. So I think that's something you see in these catalogs is that they, they are concerned to, to in many cases to minimize within the given constraints the suffering of the animals in question um but but there is no space for reflection there about whether this is the right or the wrong thing to do or a necessary thing to do in relation to some other ethical imperative and and to there is again something ludic about the structure but also something enormously compressed uh in relation to a very serious question um and uh yeah, I, uh, for better or worse, I, th I thought a lot during that time. And the office space has, has also become a space for public programming, right? Um, yeah, the room I'm sitting in now is our event space, actually. Um, and then around the corner, there's a door somewhere, maybe you can see it, which was our office. The reason why I'm sitting here is because a uh, huge brownfield, this is in the Gowanus, has moved under our building and render this floor completely toxic. So that room is worse than this room. So I'm here in order to see if I can imbibe less TCEs into my lungs than over there. Uh, but that is our office over there. And this was our event space. Um, and the nice thing about the arrangement was going back to finances and uh, everything else, you know, we stepped out from there. We're no longer editors. We yeah, everything was set up and we were just event managers here and um the all our programming was run on a very small budget uh very very uh very small budget to you know basically one person would know how to run everything here and take care of everything so um it made it very easy and you've curated shows within the actual offices um but also at other venues correct Yes, uh, we've had many shows here. And in fact, if 
you'd like, we can look at one of the shows because that what you're showing there. If you go back a couple of slides, maybe this was a fantastic show. Uh, so no, if you go, um, let me see. Uh, if you go to um, slide number 33, this is an image from one of the shows that we had. And this was a um, show that was curated by uh, Mercedes Vicente. She's a curator who brought this um, body work to our attention. And it was a show uh, by um, show around the work of Darcy Lang, who's a New Zealand artist who in the 70s was living in England and did this extraordinary project where he took videos into different kinds of classrooms this is all around Birmingham into um, and filmed the whole um, the whole class and the schools were chosen based on socioeconomic class. So grammar schools, um, there were four more talented kids uh, who were, you know, uh, not from money backgrounds, uh, public schools for richer kids and, and state schools. And he would film the whole thing. Then he would interview the teachers also filmed what they had taught, how the class had gone, also filmed the students while he talked to them about what had happened in the classroom. And then also, as you see here, filmed them when they spoke to each other. And it's an incredible archive around education in England and just education and that process of what teaching means. And, um, and he produced a set of films and also, um, photographs. And so we had the films and the photographs here. And we had a couple of uh, quite interesting events around around this body of work, but also just, you know, questions of education. And so this is one of them. And Jeff, since you were involved in this, can you perhaps tell us a little bit about this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I uh, It was a, a panel discussion um, and Mercedes, I think, uh, moderated a and uh, Kelly Baum, who was then at um, the Princeton Art Museum and later at the Met, um, and Simon Critchley, the philosopher at the New School, and I were discussing uh, this work. And so, as you can see there, we had um, periodic uh, presentations of, of bits of Lang's video on the screen. But we had cameras set up in the room so that the presenters, the three of us, we're watching an image of ourselves simultaneously projected on the back wall. And the audience would be in between examples from Lang, watching a live projection of, of their own attentive faces on the screen behind the presenters. So there was this double mirror effect, which we intended to activate the, the question of, of being observed and observing, because you know, so much of Lang's work has to do with the chance that these students get to watch together uh, the record of their own kind of pedagogical lives and, and respond to that. Um, and then there's a, there's a moment in the evening when we'd been surreptitiously recording the audience. So they were shown a live feed of themselves all the way along, then an example from Lang. And then suddenly we went back uh, to, we went to a recording of the audience in a previous state of its attention so that everyone present who'd been used to being seeing themselves live up there and, and hence able to adjust themselves in ways to sort of to, 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 to match how they hoped they might be seen on such a screen, suddenly they, they, were, uh, they were confronted with the fact that they were watching a record of themselves rather than a performance of, of themselves or, or themselves live or themselves in a mirror. And it was quite, quite a strange effect suddenly to no longer be able to, as, the, as though you were to go to the mirror in the morning and suddenly find that you could no longer control the image there. Um, and it was a, you know, it's just another thing that I think we sort of tried to do with events, just to sort of turn them in on themselves or back on themselves in ways that activate the thing that we're thinking about um, sort of beyond just the talk about it. And the other incredible thing is that there were, I think, only three lawsuits for illegally recording the audience. Uh, so <laughs> this is not the kind of thing you can do in Berlin because so-called Datenschutz, data protection laws there are so, you know, strict that the idea of recording somebody's secret <laughs> happened. Uh, we did do it. <laughs> 
Well, speaking of Berlin, um, the I know the physical footprint of cabinet now extends uh, beyond Brooklyn to Berlin and also a small patch of land in New Mexico. So I, th I think we have great pictures of uh, the New Mexico uh, location. Sure. Um, if you look at those. If, actually, if you go back to slide 21, that would be great. 21 is is the one. Yeah. So uh, we did an issue on property a number of years ago, and we had a small budget, uh, $500, uh, through which we tried to acquire as much real estate as we could. And we bought this plot of land, um, which we then divided up like this, as you see, um, uh, in New Mexico, outside of Deming, New Mexico, Cabinetlandia. And then we divided it into these various things that you see. And the, the most important one back then was reader land, where we had 6,700 readers back then. And we gave each one of them, if they wanted to, that had to sign up for it, for a penny, uh, a license to use the small plot of land, as you see there, divided up into 6,700 bits. They each got a plot of land exactly the size of the magazine um, for 99 years. And many of those bits of land are taken by people. They are legally not ours to use for 99 years. We own this plot of land. Um, Nepotismia was for anybody who gave us a nice donation. Uh, and we have project lands as well. As you see there, there's a burial plot there where all the editors have vowed to be buried. Um, and if I, if you go to the next one, I can show you what this land looks like. This is it. Um, so it's worthless, although its history is very interesting uh, and how these ranchettes, as they're called, came into being in the 60s. We've done a lot of work around the history of this land. And then we got, if you go to the next one, I think, yeah, so we had some uh, uh, amazing readers who decided um, 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 to go out there and build this library for us, which is a filing cabinet, as you can see, uh, with this kind of Adobe-ish structure around it. Um, and all the issues of the magazine and all the books, everything we did were, you know, they're all in there. And people would travel along, along this highway that you saw in the background often enough that people would email and say, do you want me to update this? And we would send the new books and the new issues. So it was always updated. This is what it looks like now as last year when I was there for the first time since we bought the land. Um, and um, what's happening now is that we're going to build a new library. And if you go to the next one, yeah, this is um, it's amazing. I think you can see it. Can you see the truck in the back or no? Maybe not. So there's a little truck in the back there. This is, um, these are students from this incredible um, arts course that um, is run at the University of Texas Lubbock by Chris Taylor and it's called Land Arts of the American West. And the whole course is um, on the road for two months and they travel from site to site, um, you know, Smithson Spiral Jetty or, you know, um, or, uh, or, um, uh, 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 lightning field or other places like that. And they spend time on the site. They read about things around that site, not just the art history of it, but you know, more, more in depth um, study of the kind of terrain there and the history of that terrain. And they do their course on the road. And one of the sites they've come to ever since they started to do this is Cabinet Landy. We're the only uh, non-iconic you know, land art included in this course, but they've come there every year and they do incredible work there. They do a project there every year. And now um, we are speaking to Chris and their students um, about redoing the library. And there were these amazing designs that they're coming up with. But part of um, last year when I was there with the course, actually, part of the conversation was to have this library, which was, you know, in a humorous way, totally self-obsessed. It was an archive of what we do and only what we do. Uh, have it be open now to explore that terrain. So, you know, as flora, as fauna, as history, who used to be there. And uh, I think it's, you know, uh, they have a small budget. We have a small budget, but we're hopefully going to do it next year. And um, it'll be a a lot of people visit the site because it's from the uh, New Mexico Cultural Atlas and they come there and 
um, they're a little surprised by what they see, but a lot of people, enough people come there that I think it would be a fantastic resource for understanding that terrain there. I myself, uh, until last year, knew so little about this land and is only with the students there who've done a bunch of research that I learned a lot about this terrain and who was there and how it came to be exactly this. And so it'll be a kind of a point of, you know, it's be a kind of historical archive as well. And also around the, as I said, the ecology of the site as well. Uh, it'll also have the narcissistic thing. It'll have all our own uh, books and magazines still, but um, the library is going to be redone and I'm very excited about the project there. The course is also incredible. Uh, the courses, you know, they do their seminars, they have screenings, they do it all via a few trucks, including that customized truck that you could see a little bit to the side of it there. It's a very unusual, extraordinary course. Well, I know we're, we're nearing the end of our time, but um, if, if it's okay, Eleanor, I think maybe we should just talk about, um, you know, what's next for uh, after this transition from from print to digital, what some upcoming projects are. Um, I know there's a book in production. Um, what will become of Cabinet when it is fully digital? Yeah, the I mean, the magazine will just be online. There's nothing special about that. We'll have some things that we couldn't do before, of course, you know, with audio and video, but, you know, um, we don't have um, extraordinary... Uh, <laughs> Uh, visions other than what an online magazine is, to be honest. Uh, but uh, we'll have these book series. The first one is uh, uh, this book, which is coming out as part of our art and law series, which is um, going to always present one or two court cases uh, around a particular topic with the primary documents and then an essay by a particular person. This person happens to be a legal scholar, uh, but it could be an art historian. It could be really anybody who can show us a way of understanding the relationship between the two discourses um, uh, um, in an essay that would open up the uh, book. And this is the essay there that you see. This particular one is going to be, this particular one is about the cases by which art has been allowed to be sold on the streets of New York City, the way printed matter has always been allowed to be sold without a license, without a vending license. So. This happened through a series of court cases in the 90s um, to, court, to align court cases. So it's a reading of those court cases and the, um, what it meant to understand visual expression as being speech, which is really what's at stake here. The book launch for this book will be on the streets of New York because we can sell books on the streets of New York without a vending license and we can have art that's sold as well. So we will have a bunch of tables um, exactly where the city packed up a lot of these artists' tables back in the 80s and 90s producing this court case. So we'll have a, a launch will be on those very sites using the, um, the rights that were won through these particular cases. Um, so that's one book. Um, and I think um, we have, yeah, there we go. And this is really Jeff's book. Yeah, this is a um, an exercise book, uh, and it uh, it responds uh, to the increasingly ener energetic project of text prediction all around us. The way that your uh, your Gmail will run ahead of you and suggest the words that you were just about to say, uh, based on you know what you've said before and what everybody else has said before. Um, we have sort of thought of all of those sentences that you might have said and that surround the one that you actually choose to say as a space of kind of the virtual sentence, it's the sort of context of the unsaid that makes the said meaningful, and that is preempted by text prediction. So this is a, a, a series of exercises that are intended uh, to provoke us living, breathing sentence writers uh, to sort of fill that virtual space, to make sentences, themes, variations, possibilities, proliferations, to experiment with this kind of sketch form in all of its potential and sort of all of the potential that surrounds any actual instance of it. 
Um, so maybe the next slide for just a practical instance of what that's like. Sally O'Reilly, who was also my opposite number for the 24-hour um, book, has a great essay which sort of provokes a series of sentence variations based on the gates of particular animals. That looks like a Komodo dragon there. You can imagine what a Komodo dragon would sound like as opposed to a little turtlet sentence. And she has a number of other animals whom she involves. Um, there's a great one on captions, uh, which is by Brian Dillon, which you know comes uh, sort of sits beside what Wayne has done uh, with that column. Uh, and there are a few others. And the, the book is an extremely elaborate kind of physical construction bound in such a way that we expect to augment it regularly with additional exercises. We don't expect this problem to go away. So anyone who buys the book will also subscribe uh, to a, a regular succession of updates. Great. Um, I think that unless there's anything that, that you two um, wanted to bring up, I, I think now would be a great time to turn to audience questions. This this particular book, Yulia Komska just handed in her book yesterday, and we're very excited to be editing that next. It's a uh, it's a history of tightrope walkers in post-war Germany over the ruins of cities, and there were hugely popular acts. And um, it's a really incredible reading of what it meant for those audiences to look up past the ruins to this particular, you know, feat of daring that was happening up there. Uh, is an article that we had, like a lot of our books, there's an article that has now been developed into a book. And that's part of a new series that we have, which is sort of... Um, we don't know what to call it yet, but um, it's sort of paraphilosophical in some sense, where we take something that doesn't seem philosophical, tightrope walking, and try to understand uh, all the historical and intellectual kind of um, uh, avenues that it opens up. The next book is going to be on um, philosophy and tickling in this series. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, both of you. That was incredible. Thank you so much, Lewis and Jeff and Sina for that really inspiring conversation. It's, Cabinet is just so amazing. And thank you for telling us so much about it. Um, we've got a couple questions from the audience today. And our first question will be from our friend GE. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Lewis. And and thank you, thank you so much. My, my question is: as 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 culture usually originates or is attributed to some kind of special, specific location or region, I love air quotes. How does cabinet, which seems to be moored in the culture in some way, actually pull off this kind of hovering over the culture? Um, I'll take a first stab and then Jeff, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Um, I think that perhaps um, there are two ways of answering that. One of them would be that we've actually emphasized today some of the things that are more like that than other things we've done. So, you know, for example, if we go back to the homepage, that very first slide, you, you know, you would have seen that as an article there, uh, it's a very Jeff Dolvin centric uh, presentation, the lead article by Jeff there uh, for the end issue. But the other, you know, article down there is about lawfare and the use of uh, the way in which law has been used uh, after Vietnam by the US and then also by Israel in relation to war. And so, you know, there are pieces that are not quite, you know, in the same vein as the ones you are sort of talking about, I think. And for this presentation, you know, you always choose, right? So, you know, perhaps we chose more of those kinds of pieces than others. Um, and then Jeff, do you have a, other thoughts about <laughs> the hovering act, the levitation act? Which yeah. So a problem, perhaps, you know, depends what, you know, hovering means, but. Um... 
Yeah, well, I took that partly to be, I mean, you were talking about sort of regionalism in some sense, and that this, it, it feels as though it's not especially tethered geographically, it's not especially tethered temporally. Uh, and, um, and I think that's, that's really right. And one of its, one of its glories, it's, it's, um, uh, it is so intellectually adventitious um, and, uh, and indiscriminate in some sense about kind of place and time with the exception of not reviewing contemporary books or art exhibitions. Um, but I think Sina speaks to the, the sort of question of the, of the magazine's activism. And I think that uh, is, a, is a question almost of, of ambush with Catman. Um, that is, it doesn't advertise itself as pre-committed politically, uh, but I think, I think it is, and I think it's, or, or certainly committed. Um, and I, I, I've, you know, experienced sort of my reading in those veins in the, in the magazine as being um, kind of more powerful because I'm, I'm, I'm a little disarmed uh, when I read it. That's from before I got involved with the magazine. I don't know what to expect. Uh, and so I'm just a little bit more able uh, to hear someone else's urgency. Um, yeah, I mean, issue one, we had a, an article, which I think is still very interesting <laughs> uh, all these years later, which was about NATO as architectural mm -hmm. critic, which is about the bombing of um, the bombing of Belgrade by NATO and the criteria by which they selected which buildings were expendable and could be bombed and which ones were part of the cultural heritage and could not be bombed. And a lot of um, important Serbian modernist buildings were actually bombed. Uh, and a lot of the things that look like they're culturally important were in fact copies uh, from the Austro-Hungarian moment of you know a certain kind of kitschy, <laughs> copy of the kind of thing that was important in Vienna and Budapest back then, those things were considered like, you know, can't touch those. Um, so it was about the question of looking at the documents by which certain buildings were judged to be minor as opposed to major. Um, so there have always been, you know, uh, political commitments, uh, but hopefully there are lots of great magazines that do that kind of work. Uh, in particular modes, and we try to find other ways of thinking about them, um, those issues. Thank you. That was a great question, GE. Thanks for that. Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question, please feel free to send a message in the chat or raise your hand. But for now, um, I would love to ask you both a question. Um, I'm curious if you could speak a bit more on cabinets collaborations with other um, maybe similar or, you know, like-minded in some ways, um, parallel organizations or publications and how much, if that is a part of kind of the mission of Cabinet? Yeah. Um, well, one of the books that uh, is getting uh, printed right now, which we didn't get to, is a collaboration with a press in Swit uh, Switzerland. Uh, called Rollo Press. We've published, co-published a lot of books. Um, the last three books, I think, were all co-publishing efforts, actually. So um, that's always been wonderful for us. And we didn't have an event space for until 2008. And, you know, so all our events, and there were many, were always, if you like, collaborations, uh, because we you know, had to find a space. And so, you know, we had to convince somebody that this is an interesting event, this is an interesting idea, and we always work with them. Since 2008, the events have been, you know, much more other people come to us and say, would you like to host this? Would you like to work on this together? So a lot of the init initiative has been taken from the other side in terms of events, but um, it's, um, yeah, what can I say? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been an important part of the magazine from day one, you know? Um, the very first thing we ever did was called War! Exclamation Point, and that was with the old Whitney at Philip Morris, uh, and this is in 1999, the old space they used to have there, 
And this was a, a war of cartoon sound effects between a bunch of sound artists in Belgrade and here that was on the radio there and here where all the all the sound done by the American sound artists was coming out of one speaker and all the uh, sound produced by the sound artists in Belgrade was coming out of another speaker. So using the stereo divide and it was a two hour attritional war fault just using cartoon sound effects. Um, I don't know how we managed to, to get two radio stations to sponsor this live, but we did. Um, so is there a recording of that online? There is, there is. Um, so from the very beginning, you know, you go out uh, partly because you have to and partly because it's interesting. And uh, there was a, you know, and we had something um, on Smithson a long time ago, also with the Whitney, that was the second thing we ever did. So yeah, so, you know, every small organization has to think about collaboration and usually it's wonderful, of course. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I, th I think that was our last question for today. So thank you for your answers as well. Um, thanks again, Louis and Sina and Jeff for that incredible conversation. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of concluding our events with a poetry reading. And today I'm really excited to welcome Jeff back to the stage to conclude and read some work. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you, Lewis and Chloe. And this has really been uh, a, a treat to be with you. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit from a book called uh, A New English Grammar, uh, a title which sounds a little punitive, and that's because it is. It's a, it's a book that's got as much grammar in it as poetry, uh, if you can really tell the difference. And um, all the poems here arise from um, my own compulsive reading of the Cambridge Grammar of the English Language, uh, which does a lot of, uh, of description of how it is that English works. And sometimes in order to explain a point will give us a, a, a bad example that is a sentence that's not you not ordinary usage, uh, but but shows us where the boundaries are and uh, those sentences are always prefixed with an asterisk and you can see there's an asterisk at the head of the title so each of the poems in this book uh, begins with an unlicensed phrase or a sentence from the Cambridge grammar of the English language and in fact each poem is prefaced with a passage from that grammar book which I have uh, more or less lightly edited and so I'm going to inflict on you in each case maybe I'll read three poems um, inflict on you the grammar first and then you'll get the poem um, <clears throat> so here we go adjectives that do not normally occur except as attributive modifiers positioned before the nouns they modify include damn, drunken, frigging, future, marine, mere, principal, putative, soul, umpteeth, ersatz, ladder, mock, self-confessed, utter, erstwhile, lone, only, self-same, veritable, eventual, maiden, own, self-styled, very, former, main, premier, soit disant, and would be. Ordinary attributive adjectives can be used predictively predicatively, pardon me, with the same sense, but attributive only adjectives cannot. Thus we can have that damn noise, but not that noise is damn. A drunken sailor, but not a sailor who was drunken, and so on. There are some additional limits on the use of attributive only adjectives. For example, their use with pronouns gives mixed results, particularly with one, a count noun. Compare 1a, the main objections, 1B, the main ones, that's okay. 2A, an utter disgrace. 2B, an utter one. No, we don't say that, an utter one. Such, such exclusions as 2B are not systematic, but they are nonetheless veritable. An utter one. How can you tell? Another one, how you can tell is because it's been smoked down to the filter chewed to the tin ring around the eraser. Everything tasty has that bit you use to hold the rest of it with. What's left to say, now you're down to that, down to the socket, 
after you've finished smiling, after you've spit the last smile out of your mouth, or after you've swallowed it. And that's a poem that uh, owes something to the piece in Camlet, or rather in Camlet, about, about handles, things that are their own handles. Here's another. <clears throat> In distinguishing between the grammatical status of states and occurrences, the first contrast is between static and dynamic situations. States exist or obtain while occurrences happen or take place. Occurrences involve change while states do not. States have no internal temporal structure. They are the same throughout their history. The distinction between the two main types of situation is reflected linguistically in the difference between the simple present and the progressive aspect. The simple present combines freely with states, but not with occurrences. The flag was red, that's a state. The flag is red, also state. She married Tom, that's an occurrence. She marries Tom, no, an occurrence, doesn't work. While 1B is the present time counterpart of 1A, 2B resists a comparable interpretation. It can hardly be used for an event that is actually taking place at the time of speaking. She marries Tom. The progressive aspect using the auxiliary B to express an ongoing action or situation does not normally occur with expressions denoting states. So he is playing tennis, yes, but the flag is being read, no. The flag is being read again. Red with anger, there is reason to fear, unless it's only saying stop and frisk with me in the meadows, friend, or blushing wrapped around itself to hide somebody's nakedness. Look how it waves away our concerns. It's only red, like the poor are being poor, not like the rich are rich. And I'll do one more. Universal quantification is expressed by a number of quantifiers of which all is prototypical. Existential quantification indicates a quantity or number greater than zero. Some and any express existential quantification and mark the noun phrase as indefinite, i.e. not specifying a definite quantity. Leaving aside the free choice sense of any, there are polarity sensitive items with some having a positive orientation and some a negative orientation. Compare 1A, we've got some milk. 1B, we've got any milk. No, we don't say that. 2B, we haven't got some milk. 2, 2A and 2B, we haven't got any milk. We got, we've got any milk is the one that doesn't work. Any is usually, but by no means always unstressed. It can, but by no means always unstressed. It can be stressed, for example, when it is the focus of negation. I don't think any milk was spilled all night. The stubbornly negative orientation of any can be reinforced by the polarity sensitive all, at all or ever. He hadn't made any milk at all or ever. We've got any milk, but only any. Was there one in particular you wanted? Sadly, that's just the one we don't have. Some of our milks are white and some are perfectly clear and some are blue in the bottle and vivid red in the glass. Which of these many milks is for you? Milk makes the man, but a man makes no milk. He gets what he asks for all the same. Wow, that was wonderful. So special. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'm so glad we got to hear from you. And just again, thank you, Sina and Lewis as well for the wonderful conversation and for just preparing everything ahead of today. It's been such a joy. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for supporting our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel and where this conversation will be posted soon. 
for the past 23 years, the rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like our daily MNC. Check the chat for a link to donate to support the work we do here at the rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation with Sunil Gupta and Ksenia and Sobaliva on the event of the new Pre-Raphaelites up at Hale's Gallery. We will conclude with a reading by Talene Tran. And thank you all for tuning in today. You can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much, everyone. From me as well, really Sina and Jeff. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, thank Sina. You. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have an inspiring Thursday.